In this episode of Mind Pump the World's number one fitness, health, and entertainment podcast, we talk about the things you can learn from other people in fitness. And these are people who don't necessarily work out to look better, but rather they work out either to perform better in a particular sport or they work out under conditions that are placed upon them. There are things you can learn from the people we're going to talk about in today's episode that you can apply to your own workouts to get your body to respond like never before. So in this episode, we cover three specific types of individuals, and we cover the things that they do that we can all learn from. We start out by talking about inmates, people who are locked up in prison, who develop phenomenal physiques. How do they do it? What can we learn from them and apply to our training? Then we cover gymnasts. Gymnasts have some of the most muscular, balanced bodies you'll find anywhere aside from bodybuilders, and they don't even care about bodybuilding. It's a side effect of their sport. Now, when we talk about gymnasts, we do mention some exercises and stuff that they do on rings. If you like training that way and you want to utilize ring style type training, we do have a new program we just released called MAPS Suspension. It's a full body workout with just suspension trainers. Go check it out. It's brand new. You can find that at mapssuspension.com. So that's two words, but all one, mapssuspension.com. And then the final group we talk about are sprinters. Sprinters are extremely muscular, and when you compare them to other runners, you can see a stark difference. Compare a runner, a sprinter to a long-distance runner, for example, looks like you're talking about two different species of humans when you compare them side by side. So we talk about what sprinters do that we can all learn from. Now, this episode is brought to you by our sponsor, PRX Performance. Now, PRX Performance makes some of the best at-home gym equipment you'll find anywhere. Uh, if anything has been proven by this current pandemic, it's that we really can't rely on our gyms right now, unfortunately. Many of them are closed because they're ordered to be locked down, or a lot of us are afraid to go back to the gym because of potentially exposing ourselves to other people, and that really sucks if you like to be consistent. Well, if you have good at-home gym equipment, you don't need to rely on the gyms. You just go work out on your own. Now, one of the drawbacks is the space that they take up. Well, PRX answers this with space-saving Equipment. For example, they have a squat rack that folds into the wall. And believe me, this squat rack is as stable as your powerlifting racks that you'll get at other gyms. They're really that amazing. But they also have uh, barbells and plates and other equipment that you could buy for your house. It's high quality. They have financing available. So instead of paying a gym membership every month, pay PRX every month and then pay to own your own gym equipment. And because you're listening to Mind Pump, uh, you got a Mind Pump discount. Here's how you take advantage of that. Go to prxperformance.com forward slash Mind Pump. Use the promo code Mind Pump. Get 5% off your product and get a free MAPS Prime program with the purchase of $500 or more. Also, all month long, our workout program, MAPS Performance, is 50% off. Now, MAPS Performance utilizes a lot of the techniques that we're going to talk about in this episode. In particular, the explosive portion of working out. In fact, MAPS Performance is the only MAPS program that actually has a explosive phase. So at the end of the program, you actually train your body explosively to unlock new gains in your body. This program is phenomenal for those of you who get plateaued and for those of you that like workouts that are a little different because it's very functional. Again, it's 50% off. Here's how you get that half off. Go to mapsgreen.com. That's M-A-P-S-G-R-E-E-N.com. And then use the code GREEN50. That's GREEN50, no space, for the discount. You know, there's a, a lot to learn uh, in terms of fitness, building muscle, burning body fat from athletic uh, sports or types of athletes that really, they don't even care so much about building muscle and burning body fat, but because of the way that they train, the side effect is they produce phenomenal physiques. Because I think sometimes... In the fitness space, uh, especially if you're like, oh, I just want to, you know, I want to change my body. I want to look good. I want to build muscle. I want to yeah. burn body fat. We only look at other people who are only interested in doing that. And we forget to look at some of the things we can learn from modalities that, you know, that produce that as a side effect. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, if you think about it right away, what comes to mind, a gymnast is, is probably the epitome of uh, the most fit looking athlete I could potentially come up with. Yeah. Gymnast is one. Um, 
uh, inmates, people in prison. This is another one. I, okay. you know, I, I, I know people. Their who, sport is to survive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say. I'm not sure they fall into the sport well, category, but they definitely a lifestyle, right? Right, right. Yeah, like, yeah, like, yeah, like, it's, like, it's also a lifestyle. <laughs> but what I mean by that is they're not a bodybuilder. They're not Olympic lifters. They're not power lifters. You know right, what I'm right, saying? Right. Yeah. It's like, what are they doing? What are they doing there? Uh, what's so different about what they do in there that produces uh, those types of results? Sprinters is another one. You know, these are people that run. I mean, short distances, but they run. Oh. And when you look at sprinters, even if you look at like decent uh, high school sprinters, and then of course college and at higher levels, uh, the muscularity they present is tremendous. There's a lot we can learn from why they produce the physiques that they produce and how they're able to produce uh, the physiques that well, they produce. I like. I mean, I like that you picked inmates, sprinters, and gymnasts because. They're all really, really different, and mm -hmm. they all. Have been, and by the way, there's there's exceptions to the rule always, and all of course, right. So there's not all inmates come out jacked. Right, 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 right. <laughs> not right. all sprinters look jacked. Also, not all gymnasts do. But the, there seems to be a, a common theme amongst all three of these categories of people, and there's different reasons why all of them come out or look uh, really fit from their sport that they're doing that. I think it's important to talk about what is it specifically because I think sometimes people just think that like oh if I train like a sprinter then I'll look just like a sprinter and there's other factors that come into play there's specific things that they're doing that are giving them those look and there's things that you can incorporate into your programming that can uh, obtain similar type of uh, results. Oh, completely. Again, if you look at them, especially in the case of gymnasts and sprinters, their goal isn't to get muscular. They could care less. Their goal is to, pro is to produce, uh, you know, performance, is to win at their at their sport. Um, now, as far as the inmates are concerned, their goal is to build muscle and strength. However, um, in many prisons today, most prisons, in fact. They don't even have access yeah. to weights. They removed the weights. They used to, right? They used yeah. to have access to you know barbells and dumbbells, and but then you know it, it proved to be a little dangerous. I think some of them were being used as weapons, and they thought, hey, we don't want these these you know men to get buffed, so let's take the weights out. The funny thing is, yeah. they're still getting buffed. Still happening. Yeah, I can't, I can't remember when we had our friend uh, Doug Bops on here. Did he? Did he have weights or did he all? No. He didn't either. Huh? No, they don't. Uh, it's, it's been California for sure, and in many many. Uh, prisons they don't have weights but it's 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 this is a cool thing this is something that really took my game to the next level as a personal trainer is I started to look outside of the traditional spaces for fitness uh, basically for fitness knowledge and for hacks or for techniques you know it started with bodybuilders with me then that was an easy transition to power lifters and then it kind of stayed there for a while and then I like oh wait Olympic lifters what can I learn from them what can I learn from kettlebell, people who train with kettlebells? Mm -hmm. And then I started to really spread it out and say, okay, what can I learn from people that don't necessarily use weights but seem to produce incredible physiques? What are they doing that sometimes we maybe forget or don't utilize in our traditional training? How can I incorporate that in my training? How can I incorporate that in my, my client's training to amplify the, the results that they get. Yeah, I know a lot of people have watched the Olympics and they have watched like certain events. Like, uh, what's the one with uh, the, um, the cyclist that sprint? Oh, where uh, they go in the circle? The, yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you seen their legs? Yeah. yeah. So you see, like, I mean, they're specimens. Their quads are bigger than what we called Quadzilla, the guy that was like in, lived in the gym and was just always like, you know, doing leg extensions and like was, had pride in his quads. They totally dwarf. Uh, you know, those legs that I saw. Yeah, if, crazy. in fact, if you want, you can literally Google uh, uh, cyclist sprinters legs. Oh, velodrome. Velodrome is, is that what it? it's called. Oh, okay. Yeah. And you'll see, like, it's cartoonish. They literally look like uh, pro bodybuilder legs, maybe bigger. Um, and they, they do some weights. You know, I know kind of somewhat how they train. But mainly what they do is sprint on a bike, and they produce these tremendous muscular legs. And I know a lot of it has to do with genetics. But you could have those genetics, and I'll tell you what, if they swam, they would not produce that kind of muscle in their legs. You know what now, I'm saying? Justin, are you the one that always touts uh, the super training book? Is mm -hmm. that you? Yeah, right? Yeah. So, so I don't know. Did you guys see the post that our friend uh, Max Marzo posted today, Strong by Science? No, not today. Uh -uh. So he shared a graph from there that I think is uh, relates to this conversation. I actually reposted it and shared it in my story because I thought it was so good. 
And it, and you may be listening right now going like, well, I have no desire to, well, one, I have no desire to go to prison, so I'm not going to be an inmate. It's <laughs> a terrible reason to right. go to prison. I don't want to be- <laughs> We're get jacked. Right. I don't want to be a gymnast either, and I, I have no desire to be a sprinter, but that's not the point of this conversation. It's the take away some of the, the things that are important, and how do you apply those tools in your training? And basically, the graph that he shared was kind of the, the adaptation curve that we see over the course of two to four weeks, four to six weeks, six to 12 weeks in your training. And- you know, what What I think everybody has, has learned, even if you aren't familiar with a lot of the science, is, you know, man, after a few months of training, the, the results really slow down tremendously. And that's mm -hmm. where progressive overload, understanding the importance of different modalities, different types of training, this is where this knowledge is extremely valuable, even to the average person who's just listening and wants to lose 30 pounds of fat, mm -hmm. or just wants to build 15 pounds of muscle, or just cares about the way they look. The things that we t will talk about it, with these three different types of training is the the philosophies that are in, within them are very important to grasp, so you can then take from them and apply it into your own one, training. One of the biggest mistakes you can make in fitness and for in nutrition as well is becoming uh, dogmatic and religious about your, uh, your 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 style of training. Um, this happened. Here's a good example of of why this is a bad thing. For a long time, this is what what the martial arts world was like. Mm -hmm. For a very for a long time, the martial arts world was you either trained like a boxer or you only you did taekwondo or kung fu or kempo or judo or whatever, and that's all you did. And what happened in the martial art world was lots of comparisons and who would win against who, and which martial art is superior. Mm -hmm. And there were very few people, there were people, but there were very few people who were saying, why don't we take the best of each, since we want to become the most effective at fighting or defending ourselves, why don't we learn from each one of them what they each do exceptionally well and see how to combine them? Bruce mm -hmm. Lee is a famous example of someone who talked a lot about this. In fact, if you, if you read his book, The Tao of Jeet Kune Do, you'll see that he talks about the footwork and boxing and the some of the moves and in, in some of the grappling arts like judo and wrestling and in fact he was shunned oh, by the he the pissed kung, everybody off by the by kung fu community that. he mm -hmm. did he was and then you know what caused this all to change was we had this you know competition called the ultimate fighting championship and early on it was martial art versus martial art no rules and that totally formed and in, in, in shifted people and now mixed martial arts is a martial art and I. I I can make a very strong argument that the best fighter, if we were to compare a fighter against another fighter, would be a mixed martial artist mm -hmm. against any pure style because the mixed martial artist is well-rounded. And so when it comes to training your body um, or eating in a particular way, you make a huge mistake if you stick in one and constantly compare your modality to the others and, fr and, and close your mind to the fact that there may be some things you can learn from these other modalities. Now it's easy to do that with all the barbell and dumbbell and, and resistance training modalities. Although that was hard too. I remember when we first start, started the podcast, it was trying to convince bodybuilders why they should try powerlifting and why yeah. Olympic lifters should try bodybuilding and vice versa. Why should you do functional exercises? Yeah, that was like a big argument. I think now it's becoming more accepted that there's value in all of them, even if you just want to build an amazing looking physique. But now we're going to take it a step further and say, okay, Here's a few areas that we've identified that we can learn from. Everybody listening right now, you can learn a thing or two about how to build your body from inmates, gymnasts, and sprinters. There are things that they do that we don't necessarily do with our training traditionally that if we did implement some of that stuff, you would see changes to your body. I love mm -hmm. that analogy, Sal, too, because there's also, too, the the importance of how you train that way. So, so I think we from that statement... Uh, we can agree that uh, the best fighter would be an MMA fighter, somebody who has multiple modalities. But how does that person go about training for all those? They wouldn't just throw in everything at one no, time. Right. No. There's actually a methodical approach on how you how you get great at each one of those, and this is very yeah. similar to training the body. So mm -hmm. if you're 
you know, and it's not just you want to get good at being a gymnast or really good at being a sprinter. It's the results that you get from these adaptations. Well, I like to think of, uh, you guys know, George St. Pierre as, as one of the greatest of all time. And, and why he was so great was because he kept evolving. He kept evolving his skill set and he would master certain things and he'd bring in a boxing element. He'd bring in, he'd just work in gymnastics. He'd to work on his balance and his mm -hmm. coordination and control. And, you know, and then he'd, he'd, he'd try and master like certain elements and then incorporate that into the next mm -hmm. fight. So they just didn't know what they were going to come up against and I think he's just the greatest example because he's so humble uh, in his approach to learning these concepts and being able to extract that and actually apply them appropriately in his fights super open and now here's the thing with training if you and there's a small percentage of those of you listening right now that are ultra specialized like there's a small percentage of you that just want to be power lifters and compete in power lifting or just want to be bodybuilders because you want to compete in bodybuilding or just want to do, you know, Olympic lifting. There's a small percentage of you, but even to you guys, I'll say this, you can learn a thing or two from the other modalities to amplify your specialization. For example, let's say you're just a power lifter. All you care about is, is competing well on the bench, deadlift and squat. You don't want to get on stage and pose like a bodybuilder. You don't care about, you know, doing an Olympic lift. You don't care about that stuff. You just want to be good at powerlifting. Could you become a better power lifter by incorporating a little bit of bodybuilding, a little bit of mobility, mobility and functional movement, or maybe a little bit about what we're going to talk about in today's podcast? You can. Now, the vast majority of you listening are not super hyper-specialized in your approach. Most of you listening just want the most fit body you can produce. You want to have the best looking, balanced body. Most people listening are after that, in which case, this is even more important. Look at all of these things that we're going to talk about today and other things uh, that you can find on your own. And what you'll end up developing is a very balanced aesthetic physique. Now, I know bodybuilding is oftentimes tied to aesthetics, but the truth is in real life, aesthetics isn't bodybuilding. Uh, most bodybuilders uh, look awkward and most people would not consider them to be aesthetic except for the extreme uh, people out there. Aesthetics typically is something that includes a lot of balance, good movement, it's something that the average person would look at and be like, man, that looks phenomenal. It looks really fit, really healthy. I think that's what I want to look like. And so understanding all the different benefits you can get from lots of different modalities, whether it be sports or a lifestyle, um, is, is key and crucial to that. And that's why I think this is an important uh, you know, episode uh, to do for people listening uh, right now. Now, so let's start with the first one, um, the first category that we mentioned not really a sport, but more of a condition or a lifestyle. Not a lifestyle that's necessarily chosen. <laughs> <laughs> not ideal. But one that seems to produce um, some very interesting uh, results in terms of physique, uh, but also under very uh, interesting circumstances. In fact, the circumstances- Extreme circumstances. The circumstances in this category are what have produced uh, some of these things that I think we can learn from. In other words, they forced- certain situations to happen. And because of the fact that these people don't have a lot of control over their what's happening to them because of you know a crime they committed or whatever, mm -hmm. um, that they figured out ways around it, and then there's things to learn from that. Yeah, you got to think of their schedule. like It's regimented. Every single day has uh, things ahead of them where they know they have to be in a certain place, so like they have these short windows. And so how do, I, how do they maximize those short windows if they're trying to build up their body for protection, to feel like they're strong, and, you know, and they can carry their themselves that way, uh, you know, throughout the day. And so they've maximized, learned how to maximize those short windows, uh, you know, as much as possible. And so that's one thing for sure. Well, well, do, you, do you think that, I mean, I think it's one of those things that just kind of happened by accident, right? Like, I mean, I think it started, I don't think like the guy who go, went to prison goes like, oh, I understand the the science behind frequency and the importance of it. No. I think no. it's more like I'm bored Survival. to death. I'm bored to death in this in this cell all day, all day long, you know, may as well get jacked while I'm doing it. And then a, as a side effect, I think you end up seeing these these phenomenal results from it. And mm -hmm. I think the first point you're making is, is frequency. Mm -hmm. 100%. Yeah. When, when I've talked to people who have been to prison for long periods of time and trained their bodies, uh, they say that exactly what you're saying, Adam, that the circumstances force them to figure out ways to structure their day, uh, add a little bit of purpose and meaning to their day. How do you pass the time? You know, otherwise you're just there and it's every day is- You're doing it, time. Right. And so here's one thing that they do 
that I think we can all learn from. In fact, this this is one of the things that inspired uh, trigger sessions um, that we put in Maps Anabolic is that they don't just use frequency, they use extreme frequency. So here's what I mean by that. Uh, typically, you know, frequency works really great. If you worked out twice a day, let's say you did an hour workout once a day or thir- two 30-minute workouts in a day, the two 30-minute workouts will probably produce better results uh, for a lot of people. We've seen this with cardio. We've seen this re- with resistance training. Inmates uh, take this to a whole nother level. They'll do things like do 10 push-ups every 30 minutes. You know, So at the end of the day, they've done... 240 or 300 push-ups throughout the whole day. And it's literally, oh, it's 10 o'clock, 10 push-ups. And they get up and then, oh, it's 10.30. No matter what they're doing- their volume just goes through the roof. They'll stop and do uh, 10 push-ups or they'll stop and do 10 body rows or or something like that. They utilize extreme frequency, extreme practice throughout the entire day. And that, I think, is one of the main reasons- why they build the physiques uh, that they end up building. And that example you're using right now, too, it, it can be that basic, right? I think sometimes people mm-hmm. hear that and they go like, well, I don't have time to go to the gym four times or five times a day to do a training session. Like, it could be as simple as jumping up. And we talk about this with pull-ups all the time. Yep. It's, so it's like one of those things where people always ask us, you know, how do I get better at pull-ups? Well, one of the best ways to do it is, you know, do one to three of them, you know, 10 times a day. All Every time you walk by the pull-up part, do it. Or every time, get down, every hour, get down and do 20 push-ups or whatever. There's ways to get these incredible results without having to drive your ass to the gym yeah. and spend 30 minutes to an hour of a workout. Well, that's the biggest monster, right, is the time commitment. And I think that, uh, I mean, that's the biggest pushback when we get clients initially is how do I fit this in? I only have maybe the short window of a an hour and that's all I can devote to this. Well, think about now splitting into those chunks of like 10 minute intervals where I could just do something as simple as like bodyweight squats or pushups or lunges or something where it's, it's just constantly sending that signal to the body that I'm going to get stronger. And some people think that's silly. Like, Oh, 10 squats, you know, what's that good? Or I can do 60 pushups. The hell's 10 pushups going to do. It does something. No joke. Again, I witnessed this in blue collar workers in my family. I must have told a story at least a, a hundred or maybe even 300 times on the podcast. But, you know, I had family members that were mechanics and plumbers. None of them are, are, are working their forearms and hands to failure. They've been doing it for decades, you yeah. know. Maybe the first. That impede with their work. Yeah, maybe the first few months their hands got sore. But after that, it was the same stuff over and over again. They're not working out. But these guys had ridiculous hands and forearms, like just muscular, like they would, they belong to amateur bodybuilders and they didn't work out. They did no exercise. Their diets were terrible. They were usually overweight, but they had these crazy forearms. Look at the next time you see your, your, your mail carrier, the next time you see your mail carrier in your neighborhood, look at their whole body and then look at their calves. I guarantee you they will have calves that don't match the rest of the body. I guarantee you they'll have muscular calves. Why? They're walking 50,000 steps a day or more just as part of their job. Now, you think their calves are getting a hard workout every time they do that? Of course not. They've been doing it for 10, 15, 20 years. At that point, you know, for them, it's like breathing. And yet, why are their calves developing so much? It's that frequent signal that they're sending throughout the day. And you can do it as simple as this. I've tested this on myself. I've gotten hand grippers and I'll have a hand, I actually have one in the studio. Uh, usually it's with me. And while we're podcasting or working, Every so often, I don't, even, I don't even track it. I just pick it up and I squeeze it 10 times. I'm not working out and I squeeze it another 10. And I notice when I do that and I do it consistently throughout the day, I don't get sore. I don't get you know, crazy. But I do notice when I go deadlift or go do a pull-up or go work out, my hands are like, you know, it's like 30% stronger. It's that big of a difference. I, mm-hmm. I love this conversation around inmates right now because I feel it's on par with probably how a lot of people feel. Right yeah. Now. So We're maybe, all on lockdown. Right. Even though maybe you're not in an actual prison right now, but a lot of people probably feel that way without having access to their gym and their normal routine and being kind of stuck at home. I feel like I've applied these principles more in the last three months than I probably ever have. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm really enjoying that. I'm enjoying when we're up in Tahoe and we have our little gym set up inside the garage. I'll just go in and I'll do, you know, three sets of deadlifts that I'm done for now. Mm-hmm. And then I go back later on and go do three sets of pull-ups. Then I come back later on and do some strap work with the suspension trainer. Like it just, it's, it's, it breaks up the day. And at the end of the day, when I, I calculate all the sets and total volume done, I've done more than what I've done sometimes in a really hard one hour workout that I've dr- dripped all day long and it just breaks the day up nice. Totally. Yeah. Now, one of the, one of the side effects of doing this, and you don't have to do it every hour 
hour or whatever. You could do it, you know, four or five times. Trigger sessions, I recommend people do three a day, or you can have fun with it and do a little something every hour. Here's some of the side effects of that. You get, you have incredible alertness and focus throughout mm-hmm, the day. Mm-hmm. You don't get those energy dips. No joke. You start to feel tired. Go do 10 body weight squats, a couple pushups, stand up, and it feels like you had a small cup of coffee each time. It improves my productivity. When I do stuff like this on a regular basis, I'm, I, I'm more yeah. productive with work. Movement pr- promotes movement. It does. Now, how can you utilize this yourself? Uh, here's an easy way to do it. Pick a weak body part. This is a great way to bring up a weak body part. If your shoulders are, are lagging or your calves are lagging, hamstrings, whatever, maybe do something like this. Every you know hour, every other hour, you do a few reps for that body part. The key here is not to beat the crap out of that body part. You're not doing a workout each time. You're just doing some reps each you know for super frequently throughout the day. Um, now there's another part to this that we can learn a lot from inmates and that's their 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 creativity. They are extremely oh, yeah. creative with what how- they can do with toothbrushes is amazing. Oh yeah. yeah. You know <laughs> what? You, Oh, the, you know what? That's <laughs> they not- make shanks out of them. I don't know where your mind's going. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. No, that's actually true. Have you guys when I was in uh, high school we had a police officer come to to do a presentation yeah, yeah. and he had this glass case yeah. and he showed us uh, all the stuff that, that all the different shivs that they make. Oh, all, yeah. all the shanks they make out of like cardboard and toothpaste and you know toothbrushes and uh, tattoo. They can they make tattoo machines out mm-hmm. of like you know like cassette players and all sorts of stuff. They're extremely creative. Obviously, you're yeah. you're locked in a you know cage and you have nothing to do but think all day long. But in terms of exercises, yeah, they apply the same creativity in that direction. Very very creative. Now, this, I think, is um, applicable to today. Like you said, Adam, um, a lot of people still aren't going to the gym or their gyms are still closed. They're limited by their equipment. You can get really creative with very minimal or no equipment. You can utilize things around your house in different places. You can hang your body. Uh, You can do a curl a million and one different ways, whether you're changing the tempo or the squeeze or the hand position or how you rotate your elbows, or where your elbows are positioned. I mean, I'm just talking about curls, which is a super basic exercise. Yeah. Creativity is another reason why I think uh, they, they do build their physiques the way yeah, they do. Yeah, and really thinking about angles and different ways to, to promote intensity in these exercises. So using walls and using ways to progress, like say a push-up to start walking now up the wall. So now you have even more intense gravitational forces coming down to where you can end up you know, bringing your legs over your head and doing handstand push-ups and it, you know there's a whole way to to progress a lot of very simple moves that uh you know if you're confined to a certain amount of space and equipment uh it does require you to really come up with with uh, you know creative solutions for that well inmates are an example of how much we over complicate resistance training totally all resistance training is is flexion of the muscles with some sort of resistance yeah. So if you understand how to flex your bicep, flex your tricep, flex your shoulders, flex your quads, if you know how to flex all those muscles, all you're trying to do is create some sort of resistance with that. It can be isometric. You can use your body weight. You can do all kinds of different things. And it doesn't have to look like what we see inside of a gym when we walk in. We look at all these machines and barbells and dumbbells. All you are needing, are needing to do is create some sort of resistance and flexing the muscle. That's it. And you've got resistance training. And because it's creative and different, it's a new stimulus, it's novel, you're going to see some great change. There's a couple things that seem to be common uh, when I, like I said, I've interviewed and talked to a few people who have been locked up for longer periods of time. A couple ways, and this was a big question for me, how do you get creative if you don't have weights to produce more resistance? One way they do it is they break uh, rep ranges of motion up. So what I mean by that is you know what a full push-up looks like, right? Mm-hmm. So what they may do is they may go down to the bottom of a push-up and do a bunch of reps just for the first, you know, four inches. Then they'll do another more, you know, you know, bunch of reps at the next four inches, and so on. So they're breaking up the range of motion into small ranges of motion to increase the tension. The other way they do it is with uh, by slowing reps down or by speeding them up. Doing an explosive push-up, for example, or doing a very, very slow high tension push-ups. Just lots of creativity around basic, simple exercises will give you the variety that you get in a big gym almost with lots of equipment, but you're doing the same exercise. Here's another thing that they do that's kind of forced upon them, but this cannot be overstated. 
they go to bed and they wake up at the same time mm-hmm. every single day. Yeah. They don't have a choice. That's they go to bed at the same time, they wake up at the same time. They all get, you know, you, you can resist it all you want, but after, you know, months and years, you're getting, you know, nine out, eight hours or nine hours of sleep every single night. That's it. Every single night you're doing that. This is probably the, the Achilles heel for most clients. Totally. Is, is the rest, right? A lot of people have the, the discipline or the motivation to want to change their physique or do something different or work out, but then they have this crazy lifestyle or inconsistent lifestyle where... And and I'm just as guilty of this. You know, last night I was up till two in the morning thinking and writing and doing shit. And, you know, that's not normal. And then I'll have another night where I'm in bed by 930 or 10. And so I know that inconsistency is not ideal for maximizing my sleep and recovery. And like you said, Sally, these guys are forced into a routine. And one of the side effects of that is they probably end up getting incredible, consistent sleep, which is only going to aid in their recovery. Well, mm-hmm. you know, a while ago we were speculating on why body pro bodybuilders who've been training forever on tons of you know steroids and all that stuff hit a pl- plateau and then go to the Middle East. What country was that that they went Dubai, to? Dubai, right? Dubai and gain like 20 pounds of muscle. Do you know how hard it is to gain five pounds of muscle when you're already extremely advanced? Yeah. They'd go there and gain 20 pounds of muscle, and we couldn't figure out what was going on. We thought maybe there was some new drug or whatever. Then we talked to bodybuilders in the know, and they said, no, they just go there. They have nothing yeah. to do. They eat, they train, they, and they sleep. sleep. Yeah, and, and emphasis on the sleep. That was the big one. Like You get lots of consistent sleep, go to bed at the same time, wake mm-hmm. up at the same time, and their bodies just built lots of muscle. I've done this with clients where we changed nothing. We changed nothing about their workout, changed nothing about their diet. All we did was emphasize sleep, and lo and behold, like magic, fat comes off their body. They, they start to sculpt and shape or build. Their strength goes up just from doing that one thing uh, right there. And in fact, when I, when I did talk to uh, the, the people that I know who've been in prison about what they did over there, aside from the extreme frequency, that was the big one. They said, you know what? Our diets aren't that great. We don't get a lot of protein, yeah. uh, but uh, you know we train really frequently and we get good sleep every single night. We got nothing better to do. We go to bed. We have to go to bed at a certain time. Two major factors. Right got, there. Exactly, two major factors. Let's talk about gymnasts now, right? Gymnasts have some incredibly impressive physiques on their body, and the way they train is is relatively unique. One thing that I noticed with gymnasts that they utilize more than almost any other athlete or person who trains their body that I can think of is uh, that use a lot of high tension isometrics. Mm -hmm. A lot of their competitive moves and positions uh, require that. Like if you get up on the rings, Mm -hmm. you can't be wobbling and moving all over the place. Um, Of course, we all know that the famous pose that they do, the real difficult iron cross, right? Uh, Is that what they call it? That is a tension pose. When they get on the pommel horse, they have to learn how to hold themselves up for long periods of time before they do anything else. When they're holding onto the rings, they have to be able to grip and, and tighten and tense their body. And everything's about tension. If you look at a gymnast, the re- the way they get scored is it's not just the movements, it's how nice their body it's looks. how graceful it is. It's how pointed the yeah. toes are, how straight the leg, it's legs are, how straight the elbows are, how well they're able to, to hold their position while they're swinging or moving their body. That's all isometrics, that's all tension. And most training programs, the vast majority, don't even they don't even mention isometrics. Yeah. It's not even in there. They're they're such the best example of like pure control over one's body and, and mastery over technique uh, for movements. And it's it's such a high skill sport um, that um, it, it, it's hard to really break down every little thing that they do in, in their training. But a lot of it, like you said, is that that high control of end range of motion strength. And this is something that you don't find in a lot of other training modalities. And that's one specific differentiating factor is they've really put in the time to then expand, uh, you know, upon like the, the types of movements their body can produce. And so teaching the body to just get comfortable with it, but then really, you know, progressively overloading to where they can do things that your average person just can't. So we mentioned a uh, gymnast the other day on a podcast and actually had somebody ask me like, you know, I heard you guys talking about the, you know, the benefits of isometrics and I just don't understand how something like that can build so much muscle. And the way I explained it, and you guys can add to this uh, what what you guys think, but the way I explained it to this kid that was asking me this was like, you know, and I use the analogy that Sal uses all the time that I love, which is the, 
you know, amplifier is, uh, you know, your CNS and then your speakers uh, are your muscles. And we always talk about how we develop muscles and build muscles, but we don't spend a lot of time talking about the central nervous system. And I can't think of a better way to train the central nervous system than high tension isometrics, because when you are tensing up your entire body like that, that you're developing the communication to all of your muscles all in your body, all simultaneously, and at, as as tense as you possibly can. That is one of the best ways that you could potentially build your CNS, yeah. build your amplifier that then can output into the muscle. So I would attribute that to being one of the main reasons why they can develop so much muscle is the communication that they're developing through their it's CNS. It's the ability to summon all the soldiers to do the work for you. Right. You know, and it's it that's such a component people just don't understand that you have the ability, you don't have to add like an extreme amount of load uh, to be able to get a mastery over that. And they're an example of that where they're really using body weight techniques. Uh, but it, this is all coming from within. This is that intrinsic, which is kind of uh, uh, esoteric in, on some level. Uh, we're trying to explain this, but you can really squeeze and connect and, and recruit even more muscle fibers to get involved in every lift. It's the central nervous system that, that fires muscle fibers. It's the central nervous system that tells your body how many muscle fibers it should activate. And the, the amount of muscle fibers that you can summon um, is largely determined by how effective your central nervous system is at talking to your muscles. Now, I'll give you a couple examples, okay? Think back, if, you're, if you've been lifting weights for a while, think back to when you first started working out or think back to when the last time you took a long break was and you got under the barbell and you were going to do a bench press. Remember how shaky it felt? It felt like almost like your muscles were laughing. That's how I remember. That's that's my best way of explaining it. Like you mm -hmm. don't have a good connection, so you try to do a rep, and it's, it's like, like da, 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 da. Da. absolutely. That's your central nervous system not being very well connected. Your muscle fibers aren't going to activate very well. You're not. Your muscles aren't going to grow very well. Remember, muscles are dumb. They don't do anything on their own. They have to be turned on. Think about it. Here's another way. If you've ever met anybody who has a who's had nerve damage to a particular muscle or part of their body, how does that muscle look? completely atrophied. It's disconnected. The body, because the central nervous system is not attached or connected to that area or that, that, that part of the body, the body then atrophies the muscle. We have no use for it. That's Muscles are what adapt and grow. And part of the way they grow is by what kind of signal they're receiving from the central nervous system. And high tension isometrics turns things on like you would not believe. Here's one of the other benefits of it. I mean, and it sucks because for, for some reason, isometrics People don't include that as a muscle building technique, which is silly. It'd be like me saying right now, only do the positive portion of a lift and never do the negative. Or only do the negative, never do the positive. You're missing out on a huge well, component. It's a tough sell because it's really hard and it's not like super fun and exciting. It builds muscle just like the other types of muscle contractions. And the better you get at them, the better you're going to build muscle. And here's my favorite part about it isometrics don't damage muscle as much. Yes, it's so, very safe. So it's a great way. To, you can literally take your routine, throw some isometrics in. You don't necessarily have to worry about overtraining. You're just going to get extra results. So I, I always like uh, you know finding ways that I can teach a client and, or show them something so they can feel what I'm trying to explain right now. Because what we just talked about can be very nuanced for the average lifter who who's like doesn't care that much about the science. They just want the damn results. And so I'm always as a trainer thinking of like, how can I like get them to feel what I'm trying to explain to them? So a common area that is really unstable in people and we, I, you'd have lots of issues as a trainer is shoulders. Shoulders can be very unstable and, you know, clicking, feeling and little uh, chronic pain they, they have there or just feel weak when they first get into their shoulder workouts. And so it takes three or four sets before they really feel like they're getting in the groove. Something that I would do with a client to explain this, the, the benefits of like a high tension isometric exercise is I would find a weight that is really hard for them to press you know, two or three times above their head. So it's, it's a heavy load and get them to press it and lock out above their head and, and just hold and hold mm -hmm. and just hold that. And when you're holding it, you are literally thinking about everything from your feet all the way up to your fingertips, the entire body being engaged, the glutes being engaged to keep your hips underneath you and the, and the shoulders nice and stacked, the chins tucked. And you're just holding that isometric hold for as long as you can and start your shoulder workout 
with something like that and then go into your shoulder press, your mm -hmm. raises and stuff like that and pay attention to how your shoulders feel. Oh, You'll, you'll feel strong, stronger. you'll feel stable, and you'll feel right in the groove to go lift. And I used to love to show this to, to show the value of, of what we're talking about right yeah, now. Yeah, great ways to implement isometrics are uh, carries, all kinds of carries, uh, overhead carries, suitcase carries, farmer, farmer walks. walks. But you want to work with isometrics through different ranges of motion. So Adam just talked about end range of motion, right? My arms are straight up above my head. You can also be, bring dumbbells down like you're beginning a shoulder press and hold there. Right, mm -hmm. the because, rack. Yes, because isometrics, there is a there is a carryover to, to ranges of motion outside of what you're doing, but most of the benefit is in that range of motion you're doing. Here's an application for the person who just who wants to get stronger at a particular lift. Identify the weak point of that range of motion. Let's say it's bench press, and you find that once you come two inches off your chest, it's hard to move the weight. Once you go back, once you go over another four inches, now it's easier to lift. So there's this like four-inch window where – you're just not that strong. That's where you do your isometrics. Get underneath a, a bar, put the safeties up, put the barbell under the safeties so that the bar is where you're weak. Push up against the safeties, create tension there, do it for 10, 15 seconds, and then rest and treat it like a workout. Um, and then watch what happens to your progress. Here's the other thing about gymnasts uh, that I really like a lot, uh, a lot is that they don't work out, they practice. This is, this is a very interesting distinction mm -hmm. when it comes to training. And this is one that took me a long time to understand. Every time I went to the gym and I thought to myself, today I'm working my chest or my back or my legs, the focus was feeling that body part and hammering that body part. The focus wasn't practicing lifts that train that body part. It's very, very different. Practice means I'm going in to get good at that exercise. Training means I'm just getting the body part to feel fatigued and sore and pumped. Mm -hmm. Now, gymnasts don't go to practice in their gymnasium, and they don't go to think to themselves, I'm going to go work out my chest, shoulders, and triceps. They think I need to perfect my position at the top of the rings, mm -hmm. or I need to perfect the iron cross, or I need to perfect how I pummel on the pummel horse or whatever. Yeah, how can I get up higher in that position more explosively, quickly, but then be able to now stabilize it uh, as, as smooth as possible? So all those little nuances, they're paying attention to where, you know, the, the joints compensate or something happens where, you know, the the, the movement overall just doesn't look as, as seamless as it could be. And so all those things are taken into account when they're going up and they're performing these. Right. And they, now practice looks like this. I'm practicing perfect technique and I'm getting technique better. You can't do that when you're super fatigued, can you? Right. No. So, so gymnast is not going in there and saying, I'm going to do this over and over until I can't move anymore because then all you're practicing is crappy. Bad form. Crappy form. Yep. So they practice, practice, practice. My form is starting to get sloppy. They jump off. Then they wait. They rest. That's the thing. There's then a they, lot more rest involved in this style of training than people realize. It, it has to be perfect every time. And if it's not, they're aspiring for their next movement to be perfect. So the amount of rest is really to then re recoup all of that so they don't have any elements of fatigue. Well, what, one of the greatest expressions that we see of this um, besides gymnasts is your Olympic lifters. And if you've ever trained yeah, with them, they never lift to failure. They never do. It's very, very rare that they're ever even touching their max load or closer max load. Most of their training is just practice. Mm -hmm. And and when you go to practice, it, it is a mindset thing, like you're alluding to, Sal. It's not go, I'm going to train legs today and I'm thinking about getting my legs sore. It's I'm gonna squat today. And today I'm I want my squat to look better than it would it looked the last time I squat. So the way you move is so important and you're more focused on the movement of the exercise than you are actually the load of the exercise. That's how 80, 90% of your training should look is focused on the training of these movements before always thinking about the load. Right. Now, fatiguing a muscle, getting it pumped and doing all that stuff. Yes, that's important. But here's how important practicing lifts is. And I'll make this argument all day long. If you were to just be able to split yourself into two twins, everything identical, one of you went to the gym and just hammered muscles. The other one went to the gym and practiced lifts. Let's just t let's say it's legs. One of you goes to the gym and hammers your legs when they do leg your leg workout. The other one goes to the gym and just tries to get really good at squats or really good at front squats or other leg exercises. Over the course of a year or two years or three years, do you know who's going to have better developed legs? The yeah. person who practices. No joke. I'll make that argument all day long. It's the person that practices. I remember first witnessing this myself. I remember there was a trainer that worked for me, and him and I were similar in build, 
But the guy just bench pressed like a tremendous amount of weight. And I remember what he lifted, but it was he was just so strong. And I remember thinking like, gosh, how is he lifting so much weight? And then I realized in between clients, because he would train clients all day long, in between clients, he'd load up three plates or two plates on the bar. He'd get underneath and he'd practice really good technique, rack it up, take the weights off, and then go train his neck. So all day long, he's practicing this lift, never really training to fatigue, not getting himself sore. But holy cow, his body got extremely developed. And he was really, really strong at that particular lift. So, tra- and this is true for most people. I'll say this: if all of you ever, if all you guys ever do is go to the gym to practice the most important exercises, you're like 95 percent of the way there. Mm-hmm. No joke. It is. Yeah, sure. You want to feel muscle squeeze. You want to do all that stuff. There's definitely value in that. But the practice element, boy, can we learn from gymnasts in the, in this particular regard. It's going to benefit you tremendously. The other thing they do really well is they address mobility, full range of motion. Totally. Uh, probably, I'd say, gymnasts above almost them and Olympic lifters. When you yeah. look at the way that they take the body through its fullest range of motion, and you know, this is kind of counter for the, the bodybuilding community. The bodybuilding community has been, you know, pushing the the shorter reps and the whole time under tension is what we're trying to accomplish the entire time, missing out on the benefits of learning to take the muscle through its fullest range of motion. And the best part about that is not only do they get all these great muscle building effects, but when you talk about like joint health and joint stability and protecting yourself from injury, man, these are some of the most resilient bodies that you'll see out there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, And remember, mobility isn't just range of motion. Mobility means you control a large range of motion. You're you're strong throughout the range of motion. So like the difference between a gymnast and let's say somebody that's really flexible is that a gymnast is also flexible, but they're training under tension throughout that range of motion. Mm. So they're strong through their flexibility. Somebody's right. just really flexible. Sure, they could do the splits and they could do all kinds of you know ranges of motion, but they're weak in it. Mm-hmm. That causes problems. Gymnasts are strong through ranges of motion. Now, what does this mean for you? Uh, well, the, the larger range of motion you have control over, the less risk of injury, but also the more muscle fibers you activate and the more muscle you build. Studies are pretty conclusive on this. A full range of motion done well squat builds more muscle than a half range of motion done well squat. This and is again, true for I mean, it, uh, to, to point out, it is a sport. And so that when they get into certain end ranges of motion and they're putting an extreme amount of uh, intensity and tension, like there's potential for injury because they're they're so far out of, you know, the normal spectrum of, uh, you know, like range of motion for your average person. And so, you know, this is the ultimate expression of that it being a sport. But, you know, we could take elements of that and create, uh, you know, a little less extreme version of, of, you know, what they've created in terms of the range of motion. So if I could get my shoulder to now get a little bit further back under control, be able to hold weight, uh, you know, comfortably in that and be able to control that, that's going to benefit everything I do, you know, in terms of like a regular uh, barbell lift, I'm going to have a lot more control and stability, which then is going to allow my body to produce more force to provide strength. This is uh, one of my favorite parts about the newest program that we just released, Suspension Trainer. Um, in fact, my sister was just texting me last night and she's gone through her first week and she's like, oh my God, like my body has never felt so good. And it's those, the straps allow you to take your body and it, with different angles so you can regress it for whatever level you're at. Cause obviously doing an iron cross and some of these, I'm sure there's people listening right now that are going, yeah, like, well, that, never this, do that. Yeah, this is great, guys. But I, I'm, you know, 50 years old. I'm never going to do, you know, iron ring, the iron cross on rings or do full pull ups on there or, you know, dips off the rings and the things that that's probably going through their head right now. But uh, there's ways to take what we're talking about and regress that. And the suspension trainer is a great example of that. It's you have you have these straps would create an unstable in, in environment, very similar to like what rings or pummel horse or some of these things that you're talking about would do. And then yet you can regress it so somebody who's 70, 80 years old can do a push up with these straps and it's, you know, relatively easy enough for them to control their body weight, but then take it through its fullest, deepest range of motion and and force you because it's unstable to have control of it to Sal's point and you take it through. And the benefits of that, I mean, I love it. I love hearing my sister who goes through everything that we ever release and I always, and to her, I, she resembles the the average client that I would have. And so I love hearing feedback like that. And she's like totally blown away 
by the suspension trainer because of that. She's like, I didn't think that this would be a side effect of this is that my body, my joints, my back, my shoulder is feeling better than it's ever felt before just from the first week of training this week. Oh, 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 mm-hmm. totally. Uh, you know, so what's the real takeaway here? The takeaway is go lighter so that you can get a better range of motion. This is That's basically what it boils down to mm-hmm. is rather than trying to go heavier with your range of motion, see if you can go lighter and challenge your range of motion so you can expand upon it, activate more muscle fibers and get uh, better results. Uh, la- lastly, Let's talk about uh, sprinters. Now, sprinters, uh, in my opinion, have some of the most impressive physiques at the highest level. If you look at Olympic level sprinters, they look almost like uh, if they wanted to become bodybuilders, they could with mm-hmm. like you know like six months of training right. just from their build and their physique. Even the long, leaner looking ones like Usain Bolt. You know, you look at his legs, you look at his shoulders and his arms, and he's built a lot of muscle on accident. You know, mm-hmm. just from training the way he does to become a better sprinter. One of the main takeaways that you'll get from sprinters is that they train explosively. Fast twitch muscle fibers, there's almost no way to activate fast twitch muscle fibers better than with explosive movements. Mm-hmm. Even even movements that look slow and grinding, applied explosively, activate more fast twitch muscle fibers. So what I mean by that is, and of course, this is all you know, considering you have good technique and good control, okay? Let's say you're doing a heavy barbell squat. Um, let's say you're, you're you know, 200 pounds on the bar, and that's heavy for you, but you got good control and everything. So you go down to the bottom, and you come up in a, in a controlled fashion. Or you go down to the bottom, and then you try to explode up. Now, because it's heavy, when you look at the squat, you're not moving very fast, but the intention is explosive. Mm-hmm. Studies show that explosive intentions build more muscle fiber, uh, bigger muscles by activating more uh, fast twitch muscle yeah. fibers. That, Speeds the component. That's right. It, and, and I think that that gets, uh, you, you know, missed. Well, I think people don't understand like how moving a barbell with speed is a completely different experience than, you know, just loading it heavily and trying to grind your way up, uh, you know, with a lot of weight. Moving it with speed, it, it provides a completely different stimulus to the muscles to respond to. Now, uh, the the thing, though, is that this is this is like sort of the top. This is the, the, the peak of your training experience. Experience. And so this is one of those things we, we always bring this up sort of uh, at the end of all these things where we're talking about stabilization, we're talking about supporting the joint, making sure all the movement is nice and fluid and controlled. And, you know, your control has to be at mastery level to then get you to this point where now I can open it up. I'm opening up the throttle for as fast as I could possibly move, which then gets, you know, your muscles to really grow. Uh, but you just got to really make sure that. That, you know, you have everything supported. I'm so glad you brought that point up because that was what I was going to say. I'm, and I'm glad too. And I, I don't know if we even met, uh, made a point to organize this where this was last, but mm-hmm. it should be in the order of things that we're talking about because I'd hate for someone to hear this. We talk about all the benefits that the sprinters get for explosiveness and you have a beginner lifter that decides, oh, I'm going to do explosive squats when you have terrible squats to start with. That's right. Uh, you know, work on all the other things we've talked about, like isometric, slowing the tempo down and the, you know, tension type movements, perfecting, practicing, all those things should come first. And then explosiveness is the greatest expression of all that together. Like mm-hmm. that's when you get that, that's that. And that's how you progress it. This is what we go back to the inmates. Like how do the inmates keep getting creative and keep progressing? Well, the pinnacle of that would be this, this part, the explosiveness, right. the explosive pushups, the explosive squats, plyometrics. Those, yeah. The plyometric type of stuff that we see abused so often, there is value to it, but we talk about it being abused because people highlight the benefits of it like we are right now. And then all of a sudden you have your average person who goes to the gym inconsistently wants to jump all the way to that because they hear all these great benefits from it. But there's an order of operation. You want to spend the time, Mm -hmm. you know, building these stable joints, building the strength, building this control, practicing these movements. And then when you get really good at that, this is a great way to progress. That's why this is the last phase of MAPS performance. Uh, When you follow MAPS performance, you go through different phases, and the last one is utilizing explosive movements to build explosivity and to build muscle fiber. You know, here's the thing about uh, about explosive movements: studies show that it literally unlocks muscle growth that you could not tap into with traditional lifting. This is on advanced uh, lifters. They'll show with advanced lifters who've been lifting a long time that by ex- applying explosive movements properly 
they unlock a new potential for muscle growth. And there's right. there's lots of studies on this. There's post-activation potentiation studies. There's studies on athletes who don't necessarily need explosive power, but they utilize it to get their muscles to respond again. There's also a, a specific way to apply it, by the way. In order to get good or to utilize the benefits or get the benefits of explosive movements, they have to be done explosively. I know that sounds funny. You're probably thinking, well, no, duh, obviously. No, no, no. Think, okay, this is, this is the deal here. You can't do explosive movements when you're tired, fatigued, sore. doesn't work that way. So in other words, when you do a traditional, for example, set of, uh, of squats or bench press, you go to a certain level of fatigue. If you're training explosively, you stop way before that. The minute the set stops becoming explosive, the set is done mm -hmm. because every other rep after that is no longer training the explosive movement portion. It's no longer making you more explosive. So it literally is – so when you look at a sprinter sprint, they're doing it not to fatigue. They're exploding. Then they're walking back carefully. They're doing a little bit of dynamic stretching. They're getting their heart rate to come back down. They wait a second. And then when they feel like they can be explosive again, they sprint again. It's not like sprint, 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 because then it just turns into long distance running. Not mm -hmm. only that, you'll actually see. So if you ever watched, you know, you know, by and by no means am I a coach for sprinters, but I've watched uh, high level coaches coach sprinters, and they will actually break up the explosive movement. So if you'll see them mm -hmm. practice the takeoff, yeah, you know. You know, fifty different times with yeah, right you know, off the block with a minute rest plus between each one, long rest period. They'll, and it'll be you know they, they're coming off the block and they are critiquing the head position where the hand pulls through. How they and then it's just they take off and then they stop because every the whole where, where's the leak of power? Right. Yeah. The yeah. whole thing needs to be explosive yeah. from the takeoff to the end. And we can take we can take from that and apply that in our resistance training. You you don't the whole movement sometimes can be broken down in segments and perfected, similar to what you were talking about. About with the tension stuff with the the bench press and things like that is look at the movement again practicing movements look at it and the parts of it and and become hypercritical well, of a part of it now think about extracting like some of the components from the gymnast so how they do this like extreme isometric tension so if i'm on the block and i'm trying to get like the maximizing the most power in that moment i'm going to get my body organized in such a way that i'm anchoring everything into the ground i'm driving all of that tension that I'm creating internally and I'm forcing it down into my feet. Now, once I get it there, I'm thinking about my technique of getting everything organized to then get triple extension and mm. throw everything out there as quick as possible. And then now you're in a position where my performance has just increased tenfold because I've applied these, these previous principles to uh, this power movement. I can always, t I can always tell when I see, and it's very, very rare to see this when someone has been coached like this uh, and they're doing like a box jump or something and you'll watch them like every, they'll do one box jump and they'll literally be like, two, three minutes in between, and you'll see even the, you'll see them positioning their feet, you know, bending at the knee, just the, the exact angle they want, trying to replicate mm -hmm. what they did before. And it's like, there's, there's literally, there's more time put into preparing the body to take off for that one jump mm -hmm. than there is the amount of times they're jumping in the workout. And so that's something that you can learn from these high level sprinters that get this incredible results is don't haphazardly go after some of the things they're doing and just think that, yo, I'm just going to go explosively in a workout one day. Break it down to that level and be that critical of every piece of the movement. And that's where you get that real great benefit. And that's also how you're safe and you protect yourself when you're doing these yeah, movements. My favorite mm -hmm. tool for explosive training is resistance bands. Love resistance bands for this. Like getting into a, a chest press with a heavy resistance band and boom, exploding, holding that position bringing them back down, letting go of the bands, resting for a second, and then repeating. Which brings me to another point, long rest periods. Sprinters don't go and sprint again unless they're ready to explode again. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is definitely something you can learn from. Now, there is benefit to training with shorter rest periods. You get a better pump and all that stuff. But that also doesn't mean that you don't get benefit from doing long rest periods to where each set – you're fresh and ready to apply yourself. In fact, it's anaerobic. Absolutely. In fact, one way you can apply this is rather than doing this crazy amount of volume sets and reps in your workout, you're going in, you're picking two exercises, and you're resting three minutes in between sets. But those sets are very, you're applying yourself. You're really driving through. You're really feeling the muscles contract. You're making them really, really count. 
and studies do show that this approach does build a lot of strength and a lot of muscle. I do think it's something we can learn. And this is a workout. Mm-hmm. It can be a workout. I think we get so caught up in that our workouts have to be like this, you know, long old thing where we do seven, ten different exercises. Like sometimes a great workout can be exactly that. I'm going to pick one, maybe two movements tops, mm-hmm. and the whole hour I'm going to break down that entire movement and focus on all these little nuances. Movement things. mastery. Oh, huge. Absolutely. Now, here's the thing. Um, you find all of these principles in the MAPS uh, programs, and I think this is what makes them so damn effective is that you know through our experience training lots and lots of people years and years and years, especially if you have a passion for, for training. And if you're a trainer listening, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you have a passion for really getting people – the results that they want, really getting them to do them for themselves, uh, to do this long term, to do it with the least amount of work, because that's important. That's when you're training average people, it's important to give them maximum benefit and minimal minimal amount of time, because time is uh, is a difficult one for a lot of people when they have a job and kids and all that other stuff. Is you really start to figure out what really works. So one of the things you'll find in mass programming is. Frequency is a, is a huge factor that we always consider. Most MAPS programs are full-body workouts. Most MAPS programs also have frequency builders within them, whether it's a mobility session like you find in MAPS performance or trigger sessions in MAPS anabolic or focus sessions in MAPS aesthetic um, or flow sessions in HIT or whatever. Frequency is super, super important. What do you find in common with the inmates, gymnasts, and sprinters? They train very frequently. The, the sprinter doesn't go sprint real hard once a week and then leave. They're doing it throughout the whole week. The gymnast isn't practicing to failure once a week. They're doing it every single day. Same thing with the uh, the uh, inmate. The next one is uh, intensity is judiciously applied. In fitness, I think ju- just intensity has been like, it's like the, the one that we just keep hammering. Oh, if something's not working, just go harder. Oh, if it's just add, apply more intensity, just go harder. No. Intensity is a factor. It's a, it's something to be played with, just like frequency, just like sets, just like reps or exercises. You can't just squeeze that one all the all the time. You run out of juice. So intensity is important, but it must be applied judiciously. So if you're doing tons and tons of frequency, does that mean you go balls to the wall every single time? Of course not. It doesn't work that way. In fact, the frequency loses um, its value. The other thing is that is our is our focus on the most effective exercises. Just look at gymnasts, sprinters, and inmates do very little isolation movements. The inmates, because they don't have access to anything that gives them isolation movements, gymnasts could care less about isolation movements, and so could sprinters. Almost everything they do is full body. Almost everything they do is a compound movement, and those those exercises just produce the best results. One compound exercise is as good as the next five isolation movements combined in terms of producing results. Now, you touched on all the different programs where we, we've we taken these fossils. If I had to pick, I would say both MAPS Performance and the Suspension Training Program probably incorporate more more than any other program, the, the stuff that we're talking about today. I would mm-hmm. agree. Uh, MAPS Performance in particular, uh, with its emphasis on the explosive component at the end of the program to the way we utilize compound lifts, to the way we we you know we throw in lots of frequency both with the foundational workouts and the mobility sessions that are done. I mean, with with maps performance, you're doing three longer traditional workouts in, in the sense of the time, but then you're throwing in another two to three other mobility sessions, with the, which are really shorter and working the muscles differently to throw in that you know that that frequency. Um, so that's what you get with with all of those programs and for yourself. Do not be closed-minded. Be open-minded. Look at different modalities. Learn what you can pick up from each one. Apply it to yourself. And this is really the key to longevity in terms of both progress results, but also just in making things fun because it is fun to try different things. And with that, look, Mind Pump is recorded on video as well as audio. Come check us out on YouTube. Um, Also, you can find us all on Instagram. Even Doug. In fact, Doug does a lot of behind-the-scenes stuff. So if you want to learn about podcasting, the equipment and what goes into producing a good podcast. Go follow Doug at Mind Pump Doug. If you want fitness stuff or funny stuff, come follow uh, me and my co-host on Instagram. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin, me at Mind Pump Sal, and Adam at Mind Pump Adam.